learning how to breathe and learning that space between an inhale and an exhale is the most valuable real estate in the world. And if you can live in that space, you will become a better lawyer, a better businessman, a better person because you are not reacting, you're acting. And, and that to me is the most valuable lesson I've learned from yoga. Welcome to Guys Talking Yoga, a podcast created to help get more men into yoga by raising awareness for the practice and its many benefits through conversations and stories with other guys. I'm your host, Derek Vandewalker, and I got into yoga 20 years ago while working at a tech startup in Cambridge. And you know, I never gave it much thought in those first few years that it was anything other than just a physical practice. It was a great sweat and a great stretch, but it wasn't until the realities of midlife started to pop up and I found it was yoga that brought me back physically, mentally, and spiritually. And I think more guys should get into yoga and start enjoying those benefits for themselves. Today's guest is a great one, Larry Drexler. Larry's a former general counsel and chief privacy officer with Barclays Bank in Delaware, and he spent a couple of decades battling out, litigating lawsuits, and negotiating multi-million dollar bank and credit card deals. And notwithstanding the toll that that sort of lifestyle will take on you, the arguing, the debating, just the sitting, it takes a lot on your body and your soul. And Larry shares all the great wisdom and things he's learned in his practice and how in the middle of his corporate day, that yoga class became a 90-minute vacation. Hey, if you like this conversation and enjoy this podcast, please subscribe and also follow us on Instagram at GTY Podcast. That's GTY Podcast on Instagram. Thanks for listening. So Larry Drexler, welcome to the podcast and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Derek. Look forward to this conversation. So I know you have a deep yoga practice, and we're going to get there in a moment, but it would be great to hear a bit more about who you are and, and what your career path has been and when and why you got into yoga. Sure. I'm at the tail end of a career. I spent 15 years as a litigator doing major insurance coverage work in some of the largest cases that were ever filed in the United States. I left the private practice of law after I got tired of counting hours and wanted to be able to join an enterprise where I was part of the enterprise and not a drag on the enterprise. So I got, went and joined what was then called First USA Bank, credit card bank. We were one of the largest credit card issuers. In 2000, I left with some of my colleagues and we started a new bank that was called Juniper Bank, was acquired by Barclays. We became the a top 10 credit card issuer in the United States. And I left there almost, uh, I guess, just about a year and a year and a half ago. And I'm now looking at spending time in a pasture, seeking opportunities that may come my way. You're on the path. I love it. And it's great having someone from a corporate banking background because it's not really the, the context or the environment that you would imagine for people who are interested in yoga. So who was Larry Drexler then before you got into yoga and what got you into yoga? I started practice of yoga in 2007 on January 1st or 2nd. But where I was then was in the path of creating this new bank. It was a very high pressure place where it seemed like every, like with any startup, we were facing what could have been insurmountable obstacles on a regular basis. I had two sons in high school, one of which was being recruited to play college sports. And I was a frustrated athlete. I, I played a lot of basketball. I had just finished rehabilitating in my uh, ACL. And over the course of several months, this yoga studio came up in conversation. The last two being my son, the one being recruited, was going with a friend to private lessons with the yoga instructor. And he said, you need to go see Johnny. Johnny's Johnny Gillespie, who you've had on your podcast. And then about a month later, our head of HR said, you really got to try this yoga thing. I think you'll really like it. She was a, it is a, a dedicated runner, marathoner, and she thought it would fit in well with my athletic regime. Uh, and so on literally January, I think it was January 2nd, I walked in saying, all right, I'm going to try this. I'm curious. I had known Johnny for a long time uh, in other contexts. And so I walked into the studio and uh, enrolled in their brand new beginner class. Did you have expectations or thoughts for why it might be good? 
Um, yes and no. I, I thought that it would. It was interesting to me as another way to get exercise, and uh, it was hot yoga. And um, but I really had no sense of what I was getting into, except there had been these sort of coincidences of things arriving, saying this is where you should go. So I arose curious. <laughs> So the universe was saying you should go here and you were like, now is the time to check it out. And when you did finally check it out, what was your reaction or thoughts in that first class? So the first class had to be a private lesson because it was January 1st or 2nd and there was something we were doing during the time of the class. So I took this lesson and I thought, okay, this is interesting. It was fun. The, the gentleman that taught it was uh, was an interesting guy. And so I said, all right, I'm going to go back. And then I went back to the class. And like any type A person, once I was there and in an environment with other people, I wanted to be able to do it. And I, and I, so I sort of pushed along. Now, brand new beginner class is, is very slow and you're doing a couple of poses and you're just sort of learning how to do things. But it fed my inner competitive spirit to be the person that wanted to be able to do these things. And so it spurred me on to then go to a class. Yeah, and when you went to that real class, what evolved from there? So at the time, they were teaching hour and a half classes. Now, for the most part, classes are 60 minutes. But I went into the class, and frankly, I, I was scared. I was intimidated. I walk into these class full of women who are able to do things I at the time, never thought I could imagine to do. I went into the back of the class and I tried to get through it. And what I remember most about it was sweating profusely, which was wonderful. That, that to me was in itself cathartic. And I remember just as concentrating as hard as I could on not falling down and not falling out of poses so that I, and, and so that I would attract the least amount of attention to myself. But then when I left the class, I realized that for an hour and a half, I hadn't thought about anything outside of that room. I hadn't thought about the, you know, what was going on at work, whether we were getting sued, whether we were negotiating a deal. I hadn't thought about what coaches were contacting my son, what grades they were getting. Any of that was gone and quickly realized that that was a 90 minute vacation that I was getting from my daily stress. And as a result, I had less stress. The other part was that I was then able to approach things with a fresh view because I had sort of taken out the staleness that had sat inside me so that I could look at the issues, look at the problems, look at the things we were doing with a new, with a new outlook, much like if you pick up a book without any expectation, you, you, it's now a new book. And so I found that to be immediately conducive to being a better lawyer and a better person because I was now actually getting away from things so I could take a new, get that better perspective. Yeah, it's such great insight. You know, I know my experience, others have mentioned similar things. You know, you have to leave your cell phone in the locker room or you have to leave it in the car, you leave it in your shoe when you, when you were changing into, you know, your yoga shorts and that stuff can't come in. You know, there's usually not even a clock in there. I mean, there's times in Bikram class where like, I hope it's the 87th minute because I'm ready to be done with this. And we're only about 30 minutes into the 90 minute class. But it is a great reconnect for those moments. And for me, it was the first lesson on a path to becoming a better person. And I know everybody's going to say that that sounds pretty trite. But one of the things you learn, and, and it's funny, I learned, I learned this Navy SEAL saying in a yoga studio. So anything can come in there. But slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And um, when you're a litigator, when you're a, a lawyer, you're trained to be an attack dog. You're, you're trained to be aggressive all the time. And what I learned as part of this was, was by taking this step back. You'll hear in a yoga studio, for those who have not yet gone, you're taking a breath, that that space gives you so much more space. And I stopped reacting in my daily life, in both at work and at home, and started acting, which meant that if we were having a difficult conversation with a, a kid or a spouse or, or work, I was absorbing it rather than aggressively diving into it. So it was made for me a much better spouse, 
colleague because I was now valuing and listening to what the other said rather than going into that attack mode that I had been bred to have uh, and educated to have. And so that slowing down was a natural consequence of that vacation, of that stopping and listening and getting a new view. We're all natural progression. Yeah, no, I, I love that, especially in a couple of levels, one around the business experience. And I remember, you know, in my days with Disney, the lawyers that really seemed to have the best control and best hand and best relationship on our side of the table were the ones who really had sort of a grace and humor in how they were dealing with the negotiation. Some had a better velvet hammer than others, meaning they could come down pretty hard, but they could do it in a soft way. And I think that grace and that kind of awareness and that equanimity in the corporate world exists, but it, it could exist more by people having more of a practice in one form or another. It's a valuable tool. And, and I, I quickly came to the conclusion, and yoga reinforced this and helped me get the confidence to do this, to decide to have to stop winning, which meant that I could listen. I stopped being competitive and started being collaborative. And as a lawyer, that was a big step for me. And very much part of, of it as, as a result of the yoga practice it was listening and realizing that you didn't have to be the loudest, you didn't have to be the most strident, but if you spoke with meaning and, and spoke to people rather than at them, you were going to get better results. And from my experience, I became an integral part of the team, not just in doing a nine-figure credit card co-branding deal, but became part of that team that the other side looked to for the rest of the five or 10-year relationship that we had because I developed credibility in how I approach things rather than simply trying to win on every point. Yep, I agree. Not every point is probably as valuable as, as the other. And there's just some points that are willing gives to engender a win-win outcome. The lawyers listening to this should disregard this, but I like to think that the contract was irrelevant once we got it signed. Right. And that, that it was our relationships that got us through almost all of the things that come in, came thereafter. Right. I was part of a, an international bank. One of my colleagues went to the international bank and took out one of their co-branded contracts, which was three binders. I, the one we had was 18 pages because we didn't need to cover off every, if, if the relationship wasn't working, all those pages weren't going to make a bit of difference. But no, we, we took a philosophy that really is the same as yoga is let's be collaborative. Let's work things out rather than trying to win every point, because at the end of the day, winning every point doesn't build the relationship you need. Right. What I appreciate about that is that, you know, and I've had other guys recently speak to how much discipline of yoga and the practice of yoga fosters awareness. And in that awareness, you can you know, discern between this or that, right or wrong, and you can make a choice. And it sounds like in that business experience, you very much embodied in relate to that yogic thinking of, does this matter? Do I need to achieve this? Whether it's actually doing a fantastic headstand or whether it's using all your leverage, the best terms possibly on rep and warrants. Yeah. It's, look, the discipline of yoga gives you discipline and it gives you the space. And, and over time, when you realize how much of yoga is breathing, in fact, it's entirely breathing, that at the end of the day, learning how to breathe and learning that space between an inhale and an exhale is the most valuable real estate in the world. And if you can live in that space, you will become a better lawyer, a better businessman, a better person, because you are not reacting, you're acting. And, and that, to me, is the most valuable lesson I've learned from yoga. So you got into this, it's been you know a solid 10 plus years. Over that time, how would you describe how your practice has evolved? I mean, clearly, didn't go from zero to Oprah, as Johnny likes to say, you know, from that one yoga class. <laughs> but over time, you started to knit this stuff together. Do you remember kind of what the arc of that path looked like over the last 10 years? Well, th there is a definite arc in the yoga studio. I mean, you, you walk into the yoga studio for the first time and you go to the back row and you sit with probably a bunch of guys and you pray that no one notices you. And you're just there. You don't want to attract attention. In my case, I was probably grunting as opposed to breathing. 
and then over time, and you you all of a sudden say, all right, now you can notice me, but I want compliments. I want to hear that I'm doing things well. And maybe you move out of the back row, maybe you don't. And then you stop worrying about what you're wearing. And you, then you move up and all of a sudden you're in the front row and you want somebody to give you feedback. And you, and you want to take that feedback and, and you want somebody to help show you how you're going to get better. And that progression exists in real life too, because all of a sudden you realize that you're not the center of the world and you're not the most important person. You want feedback. You want to how you can improve yourself. So you start with that. And then, then it starts with, all right, now I'm sort of on a path. I can stand on one foot sometimes. I can fall over and laugh. And then it's how do you make yourself better? And whether it's what you eat, whether you, what you wear, the things that you do, your shoes, whatever, how do you become better and make yourself better? And that spills over into every part of your life. And then you start looking at other things and you start reading other books and you start eating other food because those are the things to how to make the totality of things better. That whole arc was great. I mean, well done. I, I want to go back a little bit and, and talk about, <laughs> you know, I've joked a few times on this podcast, like it, literally the, the most optimal space for the new student in the class is in the back, hands down in the back, but also kind of close to the door. So if you, if you just need to like slip out, you can slip out through the door, which generally is not advised in any yoga class because it's kind of disrespectful unless you just literally need to get out of the room because you're about to faint. But that progression of moving from the back to the front is something that I haven't thought about, but it is a progression. Like being in front of the room and especially in front of like right in front of the teacher or having the mirror right there where you see yourself, you know, that's, that's intense. And your practice might be at a level where you want that feedback and sense of proprioception of where I am in the room. I hadn't really thought about it before, but the mirror doesn't lie. And once you're willing to get up in front of the mirror, you're opening yourself up and, and you're opening yourself up in a way that you probably never experienced before. And it's not just when you're doing the pose because you're willing to get in front of that mirror and look and be introspective. Some people never get out of the back row. I mean, they're there, they're there to sweat, they're there to have fun, do whatever they are. And then as you progress, as you move, your whole mental outlook for how you're doing things changes. And one of the most humbling experiences I've had in the yoga studio, which was one of the most important, was Ryan Burns, who I've gathered you've talked to, was teaching a class and he came up to me and said, go do this pose against the wall. You know, and I've been practicing for years. And I was like, I'm getting better at this. And he was like, no, go against the wall. And I did, and I did, and, and that could have been a humiliating experience. But for me, it was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embrace it. I went over, and for the next two months, I was practicing that pose against the wall. And you know what? I got a lot better. I learned from it, and now I don't go against the wall for that pose. But I might tomorrow, if all of a sudden I felt unsteady, go and do that. That humility and that willingness to accept that was a direct reflection of the journey to that point. I don't know that I would have accepted that with grace a month earlier or a time earlier, but that's all part of the evolution and the education. Yeah, those are two really great points you made. I just want to you know revisit again. And one is, even if you find yourself in the front of the room, it's okay, totally okay to go to the back because maybe you want to enjoy the fact that you have the perspective to see how the rest of the class is doing. Maybe you want that wall to lean on or to use for a particular pose to put a hand on. You probably learn more and get more perspective by having different viewpoints of the room and of the class. And so that's one point. The second point is using the wall or using a prop is something that I think a lot of guys who do practice yoga don't consider because of the same sense of like, I don't need training wheels or I don't need floaties to get across the pool. You know, I can do this. And the reality is you're really cheating yourself by not using a wall or a prop because if you've got an injury or you're recovering from surgery or you're just weak on one side, you're going to use that wall or a chair or prop to really give you enough support so as you say, your breath can just work in that place where you are, and that's where you knit together the weak part of your joint that's been hounding you. But look, no one is more competitive than me. <laughs> <laughs> and so the notion when I walked into a yoga studio of using blocks 
was something like, that's not me. I don't need them. I don't need those things. Once we started doing yoga at home with the pandemic, I have six blocks downstairs. You know, they make you better. But there is a an arrogance when you walk into some place that you're going to do things, especially when you're a type A competitive person, that you're going to immediately get in and do things better and don't need that help that they need. You know, that's something you learn. You just learn that over time, that there are there are ways to be healthy and there are ways to, to do it right. And sometimes, again, you, you got to go slow to go smooth and you go smooth, you go fast. Yeah. Those are all integral parts of that story. You know, you walk into a yoga studio and you look around and there are going to be a couple of guys there and they're going to be a bunch of women. And you're going to see a woman that's 20 years older than you are, that is doing headstands, handstands. And things that I still can only dream of doing. And you have to realize that that's not your competition. When you get to a yoga studio, your competition resides squarely inside you. And the rest of that community is there to support you. And for guys who've never been in a yoga studio, like when you walk into a gym, it's the same thing. When you walk into a new gym, you're intimidated. It, it's an intimidating process. And you go in and then you prove yourself by picking up too much weight and throwing it around. When you walk into a yoga studio, you're just as intimidated. And as a guy, you're probably going to try to do the same thing, but you quickly learn that that's not the way to get ahead in a yoga studio. Not at all. The way you get ahead in a yoga studio is do less. And there's a community there that instead of competing with you, is going to embrace you because you're on the same trip they're on, and they're going to encourage you, and you will be in a very different place. But for anybody who hasn't done this before, stepping across that threshold's hard. But you've done it before. You've done it in gyms. You've done it on basketball courts. You've done it on ice hockey rinks. You can do it here. For golfers out there, when they're 200 yards out from the hole, they're like, well, I could either lay up with a nice pitching wedge or a nine or even a seven and then take another short shot. Or they can be like, well, I'm going to pull out the two iron and or the three (laughs) iron and I'm going to make a go of this thing. And over time, the good golfers realize that sometimes you got to lay up a little bit because if you shank it and it goes someplace else, you're in a worse spot. And so I think about yoga poses where balance is critical or if you have an injury, like the block, using a block or a wall is the same idea of going down a club and safely approaching the green and then chipping up safely and getting in there. And not only do you score better, but you are a smarter golfer, more patient golfer. And it's the same way in yoga. And pretty soon you're going to find that if you pay attention to whether your breath is working too hard, you know to back off. You know to back off and find a place where you're in control. And pretty soon those blocks and bolsters and belts become new ways to shape shots on the course, so to speak, because you're really learning how to use your body. Absolutely. And going back to something I said earlier, you will never find a more embracing community than you will when you get into a yoga studio. It will accept you as you are. The issue is you have to accept yourself as you are. And that's often way harder. (laughs) Way harder, especially like I don't don't quite have the the flowing hair like I used to. So it's a little bit in the mirror. You're like, wait a minute, that's, that's what it is now? That's all I got? It's acceptance, you know, just like your triangle pose may not look like, you know, as good as you thought it felt in the back. But that's part of learning how to let go and, and choose not to be bothered by, you know, what you see or what you think. So Larry, you, you continue to do yoga. What does your yoga practice look like now? I mean, has it evolved from either frequency or the type of practice or the duration? Well, they're hour long practices now. Pandemic has proved to me that I don't need to be in heat, which was a huge lesson for me. I thought I had to be hot. And in many ways, doing some yoga in my basement, you know, for a year without, uh, without a mirror and with just using a, a little TV screen, it was eye opening because I was able to explore more. So now I, you know, try to get back in the studio a couple times a week. I'm still a little nervous about the whole COVID thing, to be honest. I work out at home and I will do a half an hour of a yoga practice after a workout now and uh, incorporate breathing into everything I do. So yoga is never more than a breath away from what I do. Yeah, no, I just started going back to yoga studios as well over the past few weeks, and I've been getting a really great workout by some really good instructors. And I'm more focused on what I'm doing than I am at home because there's so many distractions at home. And I'm also challenged by doing things I don't normally incorporate when I'm practicing at home, whether it's just my own practice or I'm on an app. It's like, 
you know, this person's, this teacher has a certain like preference for certain things. And you realize like, I don't really do that. And that's harder to do. But even if I can't do it as well, I at least say, okay, well, what am I going to do? That's the modified version. Or what am I going to do as an alternate? Because this individual has a plan for this class. And I do want to try to stay with the class. Yeah. I, well, I, the more you do yoga, the more you understand what your body needs and what it can do. And the more you can adapt to situations where somebody's asking you to do something that's not within your wheelhouse. And it's not to say you shouldn't try and it's not try, but there are times when it's just not your day to be doing a downward dog or a triangle pose. And, and so, you know what? You don't do it. You modify it so that you're not hurting yourself and you're, and you're doing things in a smart way because ultimately every yoga practice is different. And from day to day, I mean, you can go one day and, you know, being one leg all day long and the next day you can barely stand on two feet. It's, it happens. So, you know, trust, trust yourself, trust your, your instructor. And when you're hurt or when something isn't work, tell them because they are remarkably well-trained and understand how the body works to be able to help you overcome the shortcomings that you have because of an injury or because of a weakness. When I started, I played basketball three times a week. The damage I did to my body was severe. I mean, in terms of imbalances and in terms of uh, the lack of symmetry and, and coordination. And so I've had to unlearn that. Now, it's been what, 17, 18 years? I'm taller now than I was when I started doing yoga. And that's not supposed to happen <laughs> at my age. I'm, I'm now taller than my younger brother. And he laments that. And I keep down, go to a yoga studio. But you learn how to undo things and learn how to, with the things you were doing wrong and how to fix them. You know, it's not insignificant, the, the point you made about actually you're taller, because one of the great things that yoga can do is not just lengthening your spine, but I truly believe that yoga lengthens and strengthens all of your muscles over time. If you are creating micro improvements on the length of your hamstrings, of your quads, of your psoas, of your traps, of your biceps, it's going to allow your body to work on a longer length and it's going to be using the full space that your body has the potential to exist. And that takes all of that pressure off joints and discs and other bones because your, your meat suit is being totally utilized in all directions and you're really creating a healthy place for all of those little cells in your body to do what they need to do because you are not a squished, you know, package of bones, flesh, and ligament. That's a great point. The, the other part is, is the yoga practice is a physical workout. And it is a physical workout that is complementary to whatever else you're doing in terms of if you're doing bicep curls, but when you go do a downward dog, you're taking those same muscles using your own body weight more than you may have curled to lengthen those muscles and to make them more pliable and useful rather than just having big guns. So it is entirely additive. I would never suggest to somebody who has a regular exercise practice to dump all of that and go to yoga. I would tell you though, start doing yoga. You'll be better at that other practice. And the totality of what you're doing will be, to your point, make you better, make you stronger, taller, less prone to injury because you're likely isolating muscles. And there are a whole set of muscles you don't know you have until you start doing yoga. And you're going to find out pretty quickly that those muscles say, oh, you've ignored me for this long. I'm going to get your attention for a little while. Now, for me, my right hip flexor wouldn't release for probably the first 12 years I did yoga. And I knew it, I could feel that it was just there because from playing basketball and I was pretty right side dominant, I'm sure that got locked in place. But as you start to develop and over time, it has released. Now, to be honest, you know, there's times when things are sore, but there's a difference from them, from them when there are times where things hurt. And you need to understand, and you, if you have another athletic practice, you understand when you're hurt and when you're sore. You're going to be sore when you walk into the yoga studio because there are things you haven't worked out. Even if you're in pushing weights all day long in a gym, you're going to go find things that need to be strengthened to compensate for the strength you've already developed. Yeah, absolutely. Clearly, you've learned a lot about 
your body through this practice, through being self-aware and paying attention to just the gains that you're making and how you move and how you live. And you're right. Like, you know, it's not like inflammation or pain disappears when you start doing yoga, like, but you have a better awareness for what is healthy inflammation versus something that's chronically inhibiting you from living a quality life. Yeah. So here's what's going to happen to you, though, when you've been practicing yoga, probably for about a year, you're going to start noticing how people walk. You're going to start noticing how people stand and how they carry themselves. And you're going to notice that they're hurting themselves and that you're going to be able to start to predict who among your friends is going to have back problems or hip problems because of you know the thing way they carry themselves because you've learned that by watching yourself and others in a yoga studio. Um, you become incredibly aware of that presence. And after a while, you just stop and observe. You start to see how many people are in a bad place because they're not paying attention to some very simple things about how they carry themselves. And that if they were willing to work to change those, they will be much happier in the long run. Yeah. Great thoughts. And so very true. Well, Larry, it's great to connect. I appreciate you giving the time and having this conversation. And it's always great to meet a great guy in the Johnnyverse. <laughs> you are someone that our friend recommended strongly. So thanks for sharing your story. And I look forward to staying in touch and best of luck to you. Thanks. Best of luck to you. If anybody's in Wilmington, Delaware, check out Johnny's studio, Empowered Yoga, Empower Wellness, and, and take a class. It's well worth crossing that threshold. Right on. All right, Larry, thanks again. Thank you very much. Wow, so this conversation with Larry had a lot of great quotes and a lot of great ideas. So just to summarize some of the things that I got out of it, and for those who are listening, were these three points. Number one, find those moments in your week for a 60 or 90 minute vacation doing a little bit of yoga practice. You probably need it more than you realize. Number two, check your ego when you're doing your practice. Whether you're at home or at the studio, just accept where you are and who you are. Not where you want to be or where you think you should be. It's just where you are at that moment. And lastly, number three, start enjoying the most valuable real estate in the world, your breath. You're already paying for it. You might as well appreciate it while you can. <laughs>